Hello and a very warm welcome to the Studio Canal Presents podcast. My name is Simon Brew from Film Stories magazine and this is a regular podcast celebrating one of the biggest and deepest film libraries in the world. Studio Canal's extensive library of over 6,000 films brings together cinema from around the globe. There are modern favourites such as In the Loop and The Bling Ring, award winners including The Graduate and The Wrestler, and family fun too with The Railway Children and The Paddington Films. We're doing our very best to explore it all in this podcast. This time, we've got two very special guests. We're joined by director Ken Loach and screenwriter Paul Laverty. In recent times, they've given us I, Daniel Blake and Sorry We Missed You. And now they complete an informal trilogy with their final film together, The Old Oak. I had a long conversation with the pair in London ahead of the release of their film. I'll try not to take the piss with the... Oh, <laughs> the brummy accent as well. well I mean, this I'm is f- just kicking I'm, me when I'm down, I'm, I'm, is it? From not far away, the... And then he That's posh bit though, isn't go, it? Go away. <laughs> Firstly then, here is a taste of the old oak. They've been bought online, right, on an auction. They've never been to the village to have a look at the houses. They've never walked round the street, our streets in our village, you know. Right. Uh, remember a few years ago when Mary was first diagnosed and we were thinking about yeah. selling up and moving so we could be closer to her sister. Yeah. I remember well, that. We hummed and hard for a bit, like, didn't know what to do, but we got the house valued. It was worth about 50 grand, a bit more than we paid for, right. so that was all right. Do you know how much? Do you know how much that company in Cyprus paid for them houses? Go on. Oh, Eight on. grand? <laughs> I mean, Mary, Mary can't take it anymore, man, with that dick next door, but we're just trapped there. Paul and Ken, a huge welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Studio Canal Presents podcast. I wonder, in your words, can you introduce us to the world of the Old Oak? What is this film? What brought it to you? It's in a mining village in County Durham, northeast of England, a community that is where the pit closed, there was no other work, the shops are shut, and it's uh, been abandoned, really, by various governments from Tories to Labour. And... It's a, a very depressed area. Old traditions survive of solidarity for the miners' strike and the history of the miners, but the, there are others who feel angry and dispossessed and with nothing. Into that community comes uh, refugees from the Syrian war, and you have another community with nothing but having suffered the trauma and the pain of loss in their families and, and of war. How can they live together? Some people welcome them, some people don't want them here. Can they find a way of coexisting? Can they actually help each other? Or will they remain at odds? And that's the story of the film. Why didn't you tell us these were coming? The the council will be around to explain to all the neighbours. You're going to explain? You didn't even tell us they were coming? When are you going to do that? They will be around to explain to everybody. But they've got a good point, haven't they? You've got to admit they've got a good point. I understand what they're saying. Listen, like there's bands on the bus. They're tired, they're frightened. Laura, we just need to get them into the house. Right, okay, and we'll deal Laura. with it later. Listen, who are. I know, we'll, we'll, we'll just have to deal with it later. I've mean, dropped my mate in her right. All right, that's out of order now. We need that to keep calm. That is out of order. I read that the pair of you were keen to do another film in the North East after the two that you'd done before. But why this one? Why was this of all the stories in the North East of England? It's such a story-rich area of the country, why was this the one that bubbled up, that had the urgency that felt you two wanted to dedicate years of your lives to it? Um, mm. Well, the North East is a very special area, centred around Newcastle and County Durham. It's a history of um, struggle by working class people, based on the old industries, coal mining, shipbuilding and steel. All those industries have now gone. And the jobs that are left are gig economy with no job security. It's one of the poorest areas in the land, but there's a, it has a terrific identity, its own dialect, its own words. Um, the landscape is extraordinary in Newcastle. County Durham is up by the sea. The city of Durham is one of the most spectacular in, in the land. And the people have a wit and a humour and make you welcome and... Um, have so much to offer and having done the first two films there 
One about the conscious hardship created by financial sanctions for people who desperately need our help. I, Daniel Blake, was the story. And secondly, the damaging effect on family life of insecure work, um, the gig economy. And they're both stories of how the system, the economic system, is failing the people. But out of that, we felt that when you're there, you do get a sense of what is possible because of the resilience and the strength of the people. And also, the area we hadn't covered were these mining villages, which actually crystallise in in their imagery and, and the people, the conscious destruction of communities. So we felt that, that was a location and the people we hadn't touched. It was important to tell their story. But how to find a situation which would bring that out, bring that to the surface. And if we could find, in some way, reflect the the strength of the traditions there, there of the people there, that would also be good. So Paul had the idea that if we told a story about refugees from Syria having suffered the trauma of war, that potential conflict or connection to the people, the ex-mining community, was would bring out so much we wanted to say. We, we did have this deep sense that after doing I, Daniel Blake and Sorry We Missed You, that was just unfinished business. You know, both those stories you know, were, were tragic in their own way. And we had to be truthful to the premise in those characters. We, we saw tremendous brutality in the system, how, how someone needed help for the first time in their life, a working man, Daniel Blake. And we saw the cruelty of the bureaucratic system. And then Sorry We Missed You, we saw it through the prism of one family. And we had a feeling that time itself was very, very important. There was almost a character in this third film. And we also felt, too, that in time, we hope, these three films might be seen together. And I don't think you can really understand the world of I, Daniel Blake, or Sorry We Missed You, unless we understand the roots of what has happened earlier. And we wanted to try and just look at that in the old oak. So time itself became a character. You know, how did we get from the world of mining communities, a very strong union, an eight-hour day, solidarity, people in the evening having full lives, you know, brass bands and going to jazz clubs and dancing and football and sport, you know, in a very, very full life, to that kind of devastated landscape that we saw when we did The Old Oak. How do we understand how someone got from an eight-hour day to Ricky, and sorry we missed you, tied to a nap, working 12 to 14 hours a day, self-exploiting himself, thinking he was an entrepreneur of the road, a warrior of the road, a free enterprise individual. That fascinated us, really, too, because it's not only a series of political choices, trade union legislation being totally changed by, by the Tories after Margaret Thatcher and then kept in place by Tony Blair. How did someone like that end up working 14 hours a day? And Ken and myself, when we did Sorry We Missed You, we met people who were actually driven to their death by self-exploitation. There was one particular character, Don Lane, we spoke to his wife, who just kept on missing appointments because he was fined £150 every time he gave up. And he knew he was in real serious trouble. His friends knew, his family knew, but he was in this terrible downward spiral of being unable to escape from it. And then after a very, very heavy Christmas, he actually died because of complications with diabetes. How did we get from that journey? And we only understand it when we go back and see the destruction from 1984 onwards. So we hoped that by doing this third story, all three stories, you know, would tell a bigger story. There used to be a pit in the village, a coal mine. Every village around here had their own pit. They're long gone now, of course. All be a life. Just gone forever. Dave Turner, who's extraordinary in the role of TJ in your film, I understand also doubled up as your tour guide when you were doing your research. In all of your films, I get the sense that research is absolutely fundamental. But I would also imagine it's very easy to get incredibly taken by some of the individual stories that you see. But when it comes to you two as filmmakers, where's the line between what inspires you about a story and what actually then goes into the story? Well, it's a, it's a really good question. And um, I mean, listening is greatly underestimated when it comes to writing. Now, you can't copy something from the street because there's just it's, it's, there's too many things. But if you try and, you know, you speak to some of the old people in some of these villages. I mean, it was remarkable speaking to them and listening to them, actually just seeing them. 
seeing how their, their hair was, their skin was, going into their houses and seeing how proud they were of their, their homes. You talk about their youth and their interests and the hinterland to them and you get a sense of that person. And what was striking from the very, very beginning is many of the young people, they were lost souls. And that's, you know, I'm not saying everyone, but many of them were lost souls, precarious work or no work. Um, houses there now sell for about £5,000. They'd be bought on a Monday, sold on a Friday by an online company. People would be put there simply to get universe, you know, housing benefit. Local authorities from down south could send up families with great difficulties to these areas. And what they've done is created a ghetto by the free market. And so what they did was it caused havoc to the host community. You know, so by walking around and seeing that, actually seeing that in the physical presence of people, that makes a huge impression. And then when you see refugees wandering around in that world too, looking like ghosts from another world, which many of them were, many of them traumatised, that gives you a real kick. And I think the secret in trying to tell a story is to make connection. And that's the great thing about if you have a very close relationship with a director. You know, we can be our own toughest critics, we can talk about it, we can bounce ideas off each other, we can try and say, well, this is absolutely key. You know, but you can't copy something from the street because there's a thousand possibilities. And in essence, what you have to do is to try and understand the grand reality, the big themes, and then you've got to try and simplify it, and then you've got to try and find the characters who will give it flesh and blood. And they are fictional characters, but hopefully they're inspired by what is going on under the surface. So part of it is journalistic, and then part of it is, you know, sitting down with your colleagues and trying to figure out how do we tell the story. A, a film is, is like an iceberg, Eddie. You, you see in the film just a tiny part of, of everything you've tried to uncover and learn and and uh, talked about. I mean, I think we always felt that there was this element, the old mining communities were an, an element of that region that we hadn't touched. Um, I was there in the village where we actually shot, <coughs> one of the three villages we shot in, in, in 1984, in a documentary, filmed the... Uh, in the miners' club, where the many of the women of the village got together and and fed the the miners and their families, a huge solidarity from across the country. They spoke at public meetings where people had, who had never spoken before they travelled abroad. It was a huge learning experience. They became internationalists. So this that tradition, which has amplified an earlier tradition of working class solidarity, is still there amongst some of the people. I mean, one woman in particular, Heather Wood, who carries that with her and speaks about it, and others too. In a way, that's where our hope is, that that tradition will dominate rather than the mean-spirited, we want our village as it was, just, you know, all no immigrants, uh, little England, put a wall around the coast, uh, keep the, the little boats, you know, how absurd that of all the problems we face, collapsing public services, and yet we're told the biggest problem we face are small boats crossing the channel. I mean, when you look at what is happening in reality, and you consider how it is presented to us by politicians and echoed by the media, it's a balance we felt we had to restore, really, and say, look, this is the way the world is now with these three films I, I hope I hope you know it's just an aim this is the way the world is but look we're stronger than this another thing that we really tried to capture too was was trying to understand where all the alienation and anger comes from mm. that that was very mm. very important to us because mm. one of the central characters in this film is, is a character called Charlie and we found that he, he did fascinate our imagination because how do people who are once generous, who are open, who are hopeful, how do they lose hope? And it's really trying to understand all the battering and bruising these communities have got and, and see how people change through time. And again, it reflects what we said earlier on about that change from 1984 right up into the present. You know, from cohesive communities to this fragmented, you know, app-driven digital economy where people simply become just figures. And I mean, we looked at that again in, in Sorry We Missed You. Someone tied to a scanning machine where every single moment of their day is is controlled. So what is it in that, those communities where people feel like they've lost all agency in their lives? They don't know who their neighbours are going to be. They don't know the houses are going to be sold. Everything is closed. The library's gone. The church is gone. And in fact, in our film, The Old Oak is the last public place standing in this little village. 
Yeah. Those are things that we saw when we were around some of those villages. And so when you see people who have who have lived in that and they've got no agency in their life themselves, mm. things are done to them, they're not consulted, you understand their fury. And the great danger is, if there's no proper progressive political representation, the right will move in, they'll smell that fear, they'll smell that anger, and then they will redirect and find a scapegoat. And that is exactly what is happening just now. And also, it's happening around many other countries in mm. Europe. They're doing the exact mm. same thing. Alternative for Germany now is very, very high in the polls. Le Pen is hovering in France. We've seen what's happened in Hungary. Yeah, Those, Italy. And Italy. Well, Milenius, <clears throat> yeah. the far right are in power. Yes, and um, so... I mean, those populists are coming in and saying, you know, a strong man or a strong woman will solve all your problems and let scapegoat the immigrants. The Ben won't stop crying because of his bad chest. And that neighbour you saw? No. Banging on the wall constantly, swearing his head off at them, mate. I mean, if you hear the stuff that come up with him, the pub, man, gee, especially when they've had a few. You know, and then they go home, they go online and they just wind each other up. Some of the stuff that come out, it's, it's horrendous. Well, what do you say to them in the pub? What can I say? Well, I don't know, TJ, that's why I'm asking you. I say a note. Just keep my mouth shut. You've got a small moment in the film, um, small inverted commas, where they go on social media. It's almost like you make the point that people are going online to make themselves angry. I just wonder, is that something you were keen to address, that we're being conditioned to blame the people alongside us rather than the people above us? Very much so. But also we, we wanted to show that at the core of their anger there's a truth. This is the complication. The anger isn't, um, it isn't random. It comes from the fact that several of the older people in, in the pub have bought their houses from the coal board or when they were miners' houses for 45,000, 50,000 pounds. They're now worth a tenth of that. They're worth five grand. So the whole security is gone. And as Paul has explained, they're stuck in this sea of, of others coming in with huge social problems that they never had before, drugs and um, knife crime. And where's their village? You know, so they, they become a dumping ground. And that straight consequence, a conscious consequence of government policy to abandon those communities by Thatcher and then by Blair and Brown. So th their anger comes from somewhere and it's legitimate. It's how it is directed. Do you mind me asking? You speak very good English. Where did you learn? Because I lived in a camp for two years and I volunteered there to help the foreign nurses. So they taught me a lot of English. Right. But also in the first months, I decided that I am going to learn 20 new words of English every day. Ebla Mari just feels like a real find here in, in the mm. role of Yara in the film. Mm. I was reflecting on her role after I'd watched the film and I did think there's a version of this story told by someone else where she would just be a two-dimensional character, just a cipher almost. But one thing that always strikes me as really important about both of your work is the creation of imperfect three-dimensional characters and giving her photography as an absolute passion, which instantly humanises her. Well, Paul created um, Yara, the character of Yara, and the idea that she should be a photographer. And it, it's a brilliant idea because it immediately gives her something outside herself yeah. to be passionate about. Ebel, who, who plays the part, it took to it with great enthusiasm and went around with Josh Barrett, our photographer. And some of the pictures that are in the in the final scene, when well, not the final scene, but a scene where the village look at some of the photographs she's taken, they are taken by her, by Ebla herself. <laughs> but, but but she's she's a terrific woman. It was a challenge. How do you find a young Syrian woman to play this part? She's got to speak English really well, because she is the one who can connect with the local people. So we saw about thirty people on Zoom, from Syria, from adjacent countries, and from the Golan Heights, um, which um, was Syrian until it was occupied by Israel. Um, and uh, three of them came to England and we did little improvisations with local families and with the people who we knew would be in the pub. They were all brilliant in their ways. Ebla was the one we we thought uh, would, would fit the part Paul had written the best. She is a brilliant woman. She's a brilliant woman. You can judge her strength by when we said when we found her a visa to come. She said, "I don't have a passport," 
We said, why not? She said, um, I will not have an Israeli passport. I'm from occupied Syria. And that's a measure of her strength. She doesn't make a great big deal about it. She's not making speeches about it, but it's a quiet, principled position. And um, we had huge respect for her and um, are very fond of her, really. That's a beautiful thing about these projects, really, in every single film. You meet remarkable people along the line. And in fact, I think this is a conduit to talk about something that I think is very, very important. You know, if, if you have characters like that in a film, there's an absolute obligation to really try and understand them as best you can, to involve them deeply in the project, to explain absolutely everything. And especially if you're going to try and write a script, is to spend time with people and try and see what life is through their, sh- their shoes. And you'll never do it as well as they will. And I hope in time they will get the chance to, to make their, their own films. But so many people were incredibly generous with their lives, revisiting absolute horrors, mm. which were very, very traumatic. But they're all very, very keen to support us and to try and tell the story. And um, so they were absolutely brilliant. And many, many people didn't want to give their names because they didn't want to jeopardise their family and loved ones back in Syria because, as um, most people will know, there's been industrial-scale killing, torture and murder of the most horrible kind. And um, Assad is still in power. He's just been accepted back to the Arab League after all these years of, of destruction and murder. In fact, there's a very interesting documentary just recently about how now they're they're producing so much drugs and... Now that's how they're making their money. So this kind of criminal head of state is a fearsome figure and it's very painful for people who have lived you know, through so much destruction. So for people to share their lives with us and collaborate with us was, was an act of incredible bravery and we really, every chance we get, we always, always mention mm-hmm. that. We recorded and we included in the film as we were filming some stories by some of the Syrians and, and one woman in particular who's had a, a most appalling, catastrophic tragedy in her life. And we recorded um, TJ meeting her through Yara and hearing her story. And then she made a speech at the end of the scene of the photographs, which is very touching. And it's included in the extras. The problem with including it all in the film was it was so overwhelming. It was very difficult to pick up the story again. It was so overpowering. It you'd almost have to the film would have to take another course and yeah. tell that story. So it was a huge dilemma. Because on the one hand, you want to do justice to the, to that suffering and the bravery to continue to live, really, and uh, to pay tribute to that and also not disappoint the woman who had put that story on the line. Equally, um, in the end, the responsibility is to a film that isn't overloaded and doesn't feel like a lecture to the audience. Yeah. So those scenes are not in the film. But anyone who gets the DVD or access to the extras Please look at them, because the woman is um, amazing. I've been thinking, Mr. Ballantyne, our families, the Syrian families, are so isolated and worried for their kids. Some of the locals here are struggling too. Ah, uh, and some of the stories are here and here, man, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Exactly, so... So that photo in the back room, what your mother said to you, if you eat together, you stick, stick together, together yeah. right? Yeah. So imagine if all the families mix and start to eat together, we can become friends. This could really change our life forever. Well, it sounds like a great idea, but you know, I think you're taking too much on. Why no, man? Our man's did 500 meals a day during the strike, but we can pull off a dinner for a couple of people from the village. It's remarkable given the stories that you're telling, which are, are almost life and death even before you've switched a camera on, that the film isn't a bleak one. And I find this a really important point to make. I, I go back to mm-hmm. I, Daniel Blake, which bristles with so much comedy and humour mm-hmm. and, and so much humanity in it. And I just wonder about capturing the tone of your stories. Again, there are versions of these stories that could, as you just say, be a lecture. They could just be depressing us for two hours and then walking out. But the films aren't doing that. And the old oak really doesn't do that at all. The humour's there. The humanity's there. Can you talk about capturing that? Well, it, again, it begins with the with the writing. Everything begins with the writing. And the the warmth and humanity is in the writing. Then it's a question of bring, finding people who will bring it to life. And so what we try to do, or at least what we do, is is to look at people who would really be in that pub. Mm. So a lot of the people there, well, everyone lives very close. Everyone is from that area. And then you see, um, we meet people who have 
maybe comics, maybe singers, maybe just local people, some people who do things for the community, people who are able to express themselves, people whose personality shines through when you do little improvisations, yeah. which we do. And there's so many people there. And there's so many people we could have had in it. You know, we could have filled the pub a couple of times over because there's a richness in, in the people who live there. Yeah. Um, and, and an enjoyment and a, a strength and a while bearing the scars of the, the struggle that we've talked about. So you just put a team together. And I work with a, well, we work with a brilliant casting director called Carling Crawford and um, her team and we scour, you know, see lots and lots of people. It's good fun, actually. Get to know them and out of them you find people who can express. One person I should mention, particularly we should mention, is Chris McGlade, yes. <laughs> who's got the tough job of playing the hardest line yeah. uh, character, uh, Vic, and also um, Jordan Louis, who plays also plays a, a hard line, uh, but someone who could become a racist. There's elements of racism, in, and of course they don't think of that in real life. But we had to find people who would you would believe really really believe that, rather than playing it ironically or in inverted commas like sometimes actors can do when they know they're playing the baddies, as it yeah. were. And so in some ways they had the hardest parts and, and uh, they couldn't have been stronger in that. Mm -hmm. And to keep that balance in the film was really important because <coughs> you've got to see the danger in yeah. those characters. We needed that force of nature that, you know, Chris and you, know, you, you see it and there's great energy and and other two lads were, were brilliant as well. But they had to be believable too, mm -hmm. you know, not just ciphers. You know, and you, you, yeah. when you do go to those pubs, and I went to those pubs, you know, and people have a drink, you know, we heard all that. There's a kind of a frustration in their lives, there's an anger, and especially a few drinks into it. And then, <laughs> you know, you see who they, who they, who they target. And, and what was remarkable too was to go to some of those pubs and you'd see the, the sun sitting there or the, or the male. That would be a topic of conversation. Mm. And then it would nurse their ire even more, yeah. you know, give them another target, you know. And so there was a, you know, a downward spiral of misery and anger and fury. Mm. And there's no accident. In fact, like jumping right to that, I mean, they're influenced by the media atmosphere just now. Look at Robert Jenrick just now, the immigration minister, who said just recently, we must infuse every step of the process with deterrence. I mean, that is criminal, not with justice, not with fairness, not with integrity, you know, recognising their their obligations under international treaties with deterrence. And people have, have been amazed, you know, in this asylum centre for young unaccompanied children who come in and they've painted over Disney characters. And people have said, but how can someone possibly do that? What poor janitor, what did they feel like painting over, you know, Baloo from Disney? Because this might seem as a welcome to a five or a six or a seven-year-old unaccompanied adult, but there is a logic to it. There was a logic to the cruelty in I, Daniel Blake, and there's a logic to the cruelty of painting over that cartoon. We will infuse it with deterrence, the words of Robert Jenrick, the Minister of Immigration. Mm. That's remarkable, isn't it? Mm. I, I think this conscious cruelty, it began with Thatcher, but it's a real development in, in our politics, and it's very worrying because it, f it, it ends in fascism. We don't treat these, the kids as people like we treat our own kids, but just think, you paint over just little images of kids who've experienced the most traumatic experiences you can imagine for a child. One something that might be a moment of comfort, a moment of distraction, kill it. It's the same mindset that will condemn vulnerable families to hunger, to starvation, to taking their own lives. It's a view of humanity where some people don't, don't qualify as humans. And that's where fascism begins. And we know where that ends. And you sit in their disregard for universal human rights across the world. And we can all think of regimes that impose racist oppression on their neighbours. So that, alongside climate change, is deeply worrying. And, uh, I mean... That, that, um, that kind of mixture of worry and rage and anxiety, I guess, is what drove us to do the film, really. Can I talk about how you respond to, to all of that a little? I mean, can you, you seem to have terrifying levels of energy 
You, you've got three <laughs> times the energy that I've got. Yeah, good way. Um, well, let's not test it because I don't yeah, think I'll come Anyone who goes to watch Birmingham City, you know, you, you've got to <laughs> get out courage and cut this. I'm Unbelievable. I'll take my hand off Surely that's really. not going to make the final <laughs> cut of this, surely. I hope it does. <laughs> but for me, from the outside looking in, one of the most important things you do with these films is you don't take the easy way to shoot them. You don't go to a sound stage. You don't lock yourself away in a studio in London. You go into the communities where these films are made. And just rounding things up, really, can you just talk about the experience of shooting in the communities and why that's important to you, the communities where the stories are set? Well, it's much easier to shoot in, in a real pub than in a sound studio because in a real pub, or, I mean, some of it is, it was a pub, we revived it, and with the people nearby and the people walking past in the street, everything you shoot is, is there, it's true, and the people themselves are part of it. And there's a, a documentary element in the sense that whatever happens randomly is part of the story mm. and and it's true it is there you know you don't have to put it in whereas in the studio there is nothing nothing arbitrary everything yeah. you have to you have to supply so it is much easier to shoot in the real location and it's much easier to shoot in chronological order as the story unfolds because then people learn every day every day is the rehearsal for what they're going to shoot next day yeah because they've experienced it. You don't need to talk about it. You don't need to say, well, how would you feel if? You've just done it. They know it. Yeah. Continuity is easier. Everything is just, just flows. If you, know, if you Obviously, you, you get rained off one day and you have to jiggle it around a bit. But in principle, it's just so much easier. And the trouble with filmmaking sometimes is, well, it's invariably controlled by accountants and controlled by executive producers and line producers who don't understand the process. The central thing is what you see on screen, you know, based on the, the writing and based on what we want to say is the truth of the performances and the people you see. If you care about them, if you laugh with them, if you smile with them, if you cry with them, if you're angry with them, whatever, protecting that is key. So every decision, once you're filming, is based on that um, priority. So the priority is, is the people in the film the priority is how can we make them as good as they can possibly be? And that means you shoot in sequence, you support them, and you shoot quickly, because the more you hang about, it dies. You know, the energy goes. So maintaining that energy and cherishing the people in the film is, is, um, is one of the joys of filmmaking, really. And if this really is to be your final film, did they at least get you a nice cake on the last day of shooting? <laughs> Actually, that was a very, very special day. Um, it'll live in everyone's memory. <laughs> what were you, 96? No, no, I wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, was on, he was only 86. <laughs> and it was shot in the most wonderful day in June last year. And we actually shot in Durham Cathedral. I hope people will, will, will enjoy that scene. I won't, we won't say any more about it. Uh, but it was a, a very special day. And uh, the maestro here has been very, very modest. But, mm. you know, a shoot... I've been lucky to be in, in all of the ones we've made together. It's actually fantastic fun, and it comes from the top, really. And you really do feel like you're in a team. Every single person is important. We know the name of every single person. Everybody's involved in it. It's quite a remarkable experience. You know, I think filmmaking, if you're working with friends and the respect, it's fantastic fun. If it's not that, I think it could be a nightmare. But honestly, you know, you never know how a film's going to turn out. But by God, the journey and the fun we've had making each one has been remarkable. And, and that, that comes from the maestro here beside me. Paul Laverty <laughs> and Ken Loach, this has been an absolute treat. Congratulations on your film and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you okay. very much, Simon. You made that You're very easy. Thank yeah, you very thanks much. Thanks a lot, Simon. And up the blues. <laughs> <laughs>
If you're looking for something to watch at home, then might I point you in the direction of Jim Jarmusch's 1999 crime drama, Ghost Dog, The Way of the Samurai. When one has made a decision to kill a person, even if it will be very difficult to succeed by advancing straight ahead, it will not do to think about going at it in a long roundabout way. Starring Forrest Whitaker, the much-loved film will be making its 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray debut on October the 23rd. The film will also be getting a UHD steelbook, Blu-ray, DVD and digital release on the same day. The way of the samurai is one of immediacy and it is best to dash in headlong. I'll be back soon with the next episode of Studio Canal Presents. Until then, to find out more about Studio Canal Films and the ITVX, Apple TV and Prime Video channels, you can visit www.studiocanal.co.uk or follow Studio Canal at Studio Canal UK on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. I'm just off to see if Ken and Paul fancy a pint. Until the next time, ta-ta for now.